Wednesday, 2 p.m. New inmates arrive at Alexander Correctional Institution in Taylorsville, North Carolina. Officers call it one of the tightest prisons in the state. Inmates call it hell. At processing, a convicted murderer gets his first taste of what life will be like at Alexander. The inmate reluctantly complies with a body cavity search. Then, the officer forces him to put on his new prison uniform. Now another officer tells him he can keep only a fraction of his personal belongings. Go ahead and put these back together or get rid of them. You throw all this stuff away, won't you throw it I'm not allowed to. They're small controls, but it's just the beginning. Alexander operates with one thing in mind, total control. Lives depend on it. Turn around. Alexander houses some of the most dangerous felons in the state. Murderers, rapists, child molesters. 25% of these inmates are never going home. To keep volatile prisoners like these from going off, the staff rules with an iron fist. Assistant Superintendent Keith Whitener makes sure inmates know who's in charge the moment they arrive. One of the things you'll hear inmates talk about when they come into a prison, especially your longer term offenders, this is my home, this is my cell. No, it's not their cell, it's my cell, it's my staff cell. Set your back right there, step up to Officer Miller, he's gonna mail the texture, we'll get you on the med. I had heard when I was at the other prison that, um, that this prison don't allow all that stealing and all that gang banging and all that that uh, homosexuality, they, they don't have all that. So, you know, it's either you're going to buy by their rules or you basically you know, going to hit the highway, you know. They're going to get you up out of here. Alexander appears spick and span, but things aren't always as they seem. The facility's iron grip may be loosening. There's something seething beneath the surface that could jeopardize the overwhelming security of Alexander Correctional. One of the biggest threats to security within any prison is gang activity. The North Carolina Department of Corrections has established the Security Threat Group, or STG, a special unit to tag gang members and track their movement within the state's prisons. Alexander has nine gangs operating within its facility. I'm going to ask you a few questions, Harris. Uh, are you ever been a member of a street gang? Officers photograph all tattoos and brandings, looking for any gang affiliations. By identifying these people when they come through the front door, we put them on notice that we know who you are, and if you want to come here and you want to do your time, you know, what you do on the street is your business, but you're not going to bring that into our facility, and you're not going to become involved in it without us holding you accountable for it. The STG assesses and rates each gang affiliate from one to three. Based on the threat he poses to prison security, three is the highest threat. Inmates immediately receive additional restrictions based on their threat level. Those that pose the greatest threat are sent here. The hole. Segregation. In a prison notorious for tight security, this is where controls are most severe. This is the prison within the prison. Inmates here spend 23 hours a day in a 7 by 10 foot cell. A typical stay is 30 days. Some prisoners have been here for years. The reason we do not have the problems that some institutions or some facilities have with the gangs and with the drugs is control. Um, we try to stay a step ahead of them, and fortunately for us, so far we have. 
Lieutenant James Gribble is the facility intelligence officer at Alexander. Today, he's following a lead regarding a possible power struggle within the gangs. If the gangs get a, a foothold in one of the housing units, they're going to run everything. Gang activity doesn't stop just because gangsters are locked up. If anything, it forces gangsters to become more devious. They're going to make the nine gang members pay rent to live there, which could be anywhere from $5 a week to $100 a month. And they'll pay it off in canteen, or they'll have their families extort their family, have them send money and put it in their account. So it's, a, it's an ongoing thing to try to stay on top of it. Maintaining that control requires information. But Gribble gets it only in pieces. Inmate mail, monitored phone lines, even rumors and anonymous tips. But to put together these scraps of information, Gribble needs to think like a gang member. And to do that, he needs help. According to Avery Cummings, he got into gangs when he was six years old. At 13, he inherited a top rank in the Folk Nation, one of the largest gang alliances in the country. Now he's doing 16 years for putting two bullets in a rival's heart. Really don't feel that too much about it. Just another day. I regret doing it because I got locked up, but I don't regret killing him because I knew it would either come to either me or him eventually. The STG unit rates Avery a three, the highest threat to prison security. I've been prone to violence pretty much since, I'll say since birth. Over the years, Avery and Gribble have established a unique relationship. Though they each have their own agenda, at times they're able to work together to keep down gang violence. According to the Folk Nation bylaws, you don't wage war on the inside. How you doing, bud? I'm doing all right. How you doing? Yeah, you know how it is. If there's one gangster at Alexander who knows what's going down, it's Avery Cummings. I got some. I heard a rumor that there's a beef between you and Trav. Yes or no? I don't know the answer to that until we get face to face. Do you think Avery's not a snitch. He never reveals names, and he won't say anything that could hurt his own business. What's the basis of his beef? Power struggle. He may have another reason for talking with Gribble. He could be bargaining for more time before being shipped off to a gang reconditioning program at a nearby prison. It's going to be a positive thing. The program aims to give gangsters a way out of the life. But Avery's afraid he'll be forced to renounce his gang if he goes. Don't go to this program with a negative attitude. Because. Well, how can I look at it any other way, though? Gribble's been pressing Avery to attend the program for a long time. Like I said, I still don't see a benefit from it from me going, though. Well, unfortunately, Avery, all level three's got to go. So far, Avery's done everything he could to avoid the program. I told him, I said, well, if they send me to that program, I'll shut it down. He said, well, how are you going to shut it down? I said, well, there's more than one way. I said, first, I'll start off by beating the crap out of all of the committee members. The threat kept Avery from being sent to the program at least temporarily. But it also landed him in segregation. It's 5 p.m. Time for Lieutenant Gribble and officers to probe one of their most reliable sources for gang information. Gribble estimates that 90% of the intelligence they gather on illegal activity comes from inmate trash. It's not the cleanest job in the, in the institution, but sometimes we can get a lot of stuff out of here. I've personally done searches where you find them confessing to crimes. They're writing to their sister, well, they didn't catch me doing this robbery. Hmm. Unaware their trash is being searched, inmates in segregation think nothing of throwing away incriminating notes with their everyday garbage. We found one little bit ago where a guy said he had some white for sale for 40 stamps. He's probably got some cocaine in there. Uh, might have some marijuana in there, but uh, 40 stamps buys a lot. That's a lot of money in here. After digging through the trash for nearly an hour, the team has amassed a pile of promising leads.
They don't realize it yet, but they've just uncovered a document that threatens to undermine prison security and could tip the balance of control at Alexander Correctional. In the morning, there's a false sense of calm at Alexander Correctional. The first shift arrives just before dawn. New officer Larry Carver is about to learn just how difficult it is to maintain control over an entire unit of violent criminals. Unfortunately, he will learn it the hard way. You never know how to feel because you never know what to expect here. It could be a very laid back day or it could be a very hassling day. At 24, Carver is one of the youngest officers on staff. He's also one of the smallest. He's assigned to Blue Unit, home to new prisoners, prisoners without jobs, and those inmates the prison labels difficult to manage. Unlike in segregation, inmates in Blue are not restricted to their cells. They're free to come and go in the day room. Here, anything could happen. Keep your door closed at all times. It's for both your safety and the safety of my staff. For the first three hours of his 12-hour shift, Carver manages inmate traffic from the control room. From this board, he can open and close every door on the unit. Prisoners buzz the board to be let out of their cells and flash their cell numbers to be let back in. In between, cell doors must remain closed and locked. Alexander was the first in the state to implement this rule, cutting down on the thefts, assaults, and rapes that can happen inside a cell. But there's always the day room, where inmates can congregate en masse and roam freely. There are few places in Alexander where they have the advantage. This is one of them. The officers on the floor are counting on Carver for their safety. It is a matter of trust between the officers because you are outnumbered by a whole lot here. Um, it's a little over 200 inmates to eight officers at times. But you have to know that the officer working next to you does have your back if something were to happen. Despite all the controls in place, things do happen here. The North Control, this is Carver. Mm -hmm. An undercurrent of potential violence permeates the facility. Okay, so do they know that? Okay. Suddenly, Carver's alerted to possible trouble in his unit. Oh, well, there's an inmate over in Charlie Wing, but the other inmates found out what he has done, and they're not too happy with it. There's one crime that inmates do not tolerate, one that could even drive them to murder. He raped a three-month-old baby, and the inmates, all the other inmates have found out about that, and they've put him on a so-called hit list. From the safety of the control room, young officer Carver stays alert for any signs of inmate justice. But it's vital he realizes that while he's watching the inmates, they're also watching him, looking for any signs of vulnerability. 11 a.m., rec time. Officers are even more vulnerable on the yard, where inmates can outnumber them 75 to 1. If the sun jump on this yard right now, we got one officer right there. Yeah. He's standing right here. One officer. Now, what can that one officer do? He just got his badge. He really just got his name tag. He's scared himself, to be honest with you. Officer Michael Herndon works the yard today. He must be prepared for anything. It usually stays pretty calm out here. I mean, no, no one wants to get in trouble. But sometimes, trouble stems from the smallest incident. It's just a lot of rules that you got to go through at this prison that you ain't got to go through at other prisons. We already doing our time. We know we done wrong, but they still just thinking 
They can just do us any kind of way because we locked up. I don't feel it's right. I know we done wrong. They got they doing their job, but they taking it out of character when they do their job. They tell you how to do this, do that, do that, and third. We ain't man, kids. What you been we, lying grown, about, man? we grown men. Come on, man. Don't be doing that, man. What's up, man? Hey, stop playing, man. You see that got me on camera for real, man. What is man, you doing, man? No, nigga, I share the spotlight with you. Man, you over here playing, man. What's up, man? Dumb as hell, man. Go Herndon responds before the argument escalates. Damn, let's go. We'll see when we get back to For this brief skirmish, these two inmates will be thrown in the hole for weeks. It's a testament to the zero tolerance officers exercise at Alexander. Hold on, man. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, hey. Hold it. Don't stop being scared, man. I ain't gonna do nothing to you. Just man. stand still and be quiet. Face that wall right now. Outbursts can happen at any time on the yard. Be still. But one thing the prison has never seen out here is an escape. Surrounding the entire facility is an impenetrable security fence. The same fence Israel put up in the West Bank. Should an inmate apply pressure to any link of the fence, alarms immediately sound at master control, pinpointing the exact location of the breach. Cameras automatically home in to the sp A signal is sent to the PPVs, perimeter patrol vehicles. Armed with multiple weapons, a 357, a 12 gauge, and an M14 assault rifle. They circle the prison 24 hours a day. They can reach any section of the fence in seconds. Back in the office, Lieutenant Gribble and Officer Brian Taylor analyze what they've gleaned from the inmate trash, looking for traces of any illegal activity. Most of it is actual garbage, but they've also intercepted suspicious communications between inmates. The trash in the, in the institution is the UPS of the institution. Despite being one of the tightest facilities in the state, inmates here have found a simple but effective way to send messages back and forth using inmate janitors. Somebody throw it in at one end of the institution and it ends up in the other end on its way out while the in between the janitors are digging it out and distributing it. So they use the trash, you know, like, like UPS, like a courier service, to get things from point A to point B. The note Gribble's working on is in pieces, but the slang, MOB, points to gang activity. Men of business, which is strictly their drug stuff, their, their wheelings and dealings but uh, MOB is what set it off for us. And then here they got another one. Weed for him, and then it's got MOB underneath of it. So this is all not only gang related, but it's drug related as well. So it might take us a couple hours to get this piece together, but we should be able to get enough of to find out who's doing what. In fact, Gribble is just scratching the surface. There are several clues that point to drug activity within the facility. And what the lieutenant is about to discover would blow him away. A drug ring that's larger and more dangerous than he ever imagined. It's chow time for the men of Blue Unit at Alexander Correctional. This is one of the few times of the day when different units mix. The odds of violence breaking out are now at their highest. To minimize that possibility, inmates cannot sit just anywhere. Officers show each prisoner to a seat. Nearly 300 felons squeeze into one room with just a few officers present, including new officer Larry Carver. There is a way you've got to learn how to look for things by certain movements, certain actions. You always have to be paying attention to what they're doing. In the prison segregation unit, lunch is an unpredictable time for Officer Bridget Wise. 
some days go pretty good. You never really know what they're going to do. Wise opens a small trap door to pass through food. It's open only for a second, but that's all an inmate needs. They'll spit on you and throw feces or urine. I've had inmates to try to assault me and miss. I've had two different inmates grab me by the arm. One of the inmates Bridget is about to serve is Harold Goins, a leader of the Bloods, the largest gang in Alexander. Goins has attacked officers before, several times. On the outside, he once violently assaulted a lawyer in broad daylight as she was walking out of the courthouse. After watching him for about two weeks, you know, at all that movement, I caught him one day walking, ran up behind him with a straight razor, cut their throat, and ran. Goins continues to cause trouble on the inside. It is no form of rehabilitation, it's torture. It's suffering, it's pain. One thing that the prison system has failed to realize, this doesn't make me better. It makes me more angry. It makes me want to retaliate. This time, he takes his tray quietly. But another inmate on Wise's rounds gets more than a meal. He gets a punishment. Devin Calhoun is getting served neutral loaf. The inmates call it vomit loaf. This is neutral loaf, and this is what inmates will eat if they're on a disciplinary. The number one thing that they get put on this for back here is an ex exposing themselves to officers, masturbating in front of officers, female staff mostly. And uh, that has really cut down on that happening. They're on this three times a day for seven days, and they get a milk to go with it. And it's, it's nutritious, but it's nasty. When you get it, it's hard. It got mold on it. It got freezer burn. And when you bite into it, 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 it can just turn to dust in your mouth. That first one they brought me, I ate it. And it, it, it made my stomach cramp up, man. And I've been eating and acid since then. I, I haven't had a bowel movement in three days. Suddenly, chaos breaks out. An inmate on the lower tier is thrashing out of control in his cell, and it set off everyone. He won't settle down, but officers know how to handle a case like this. He has a lot of bad days. When we had him with a staff assault, it took several of us to wrestle him down. There was about four or five of us to get him down when he goes off like that. They lock him in the SEG shower room. In here, he has nothing to throw, nothing to attack officers with, or so it seems. Suddenly, he starts spitting at Alexander. Some inmates have TB, hepatitis B, and other deadly diseases, but the officers don't know who has what. They must react as if under fire. To punish him for his outburst, the team removes everything from his cell. They'll keep it for three days. It's another way officers flex their control. Lieutenant Gribble and Officer Taylor continue working on the intelligence they pulled from the trash and segregation. Ultimately, it is a simple, straightforward note they've found that has shattering implications. The details of the note are classified, but it implies inmates are operating a major drug ring behind prison walls. 
Someone is smuggling marijuana, Oxycontin, and Xanax into the facility, right under the officers' noses. So this little piece of paper that we took out of the trash is going to help me convict about eight or nine inmates in, in drug ring. I still have to do some more investigation, so by the time I get done, we'll have all eight or nine of them locked up. To throw them in the hole, Gribble needs hard evidence. And one way to get it, a surprise shakedown in segregation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate all of you here. We'll be searching SAG today. Use your search mirrors. Use your... It is a simple, straightforward note they've found that has shattering implications. Good reason why we do this. The details of the note are classified, but it implies inmates are operating a major drug ring behind prison walls. Someone is smuggling marijuana, Oxycontin, and Xanax into the facility, right under the officers' noses. So this little piece of paper that we took out of the trash is going to help me convict about eight or nine inmates in, in drug ring. I still have to do some more investigation, so by the time I get done, we'll have all eight or nine of them locked up. To throw them in the hole, Gribble needs hard evidence. And one way to get it, a surprise shakedown in segregation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate all of you here. We'll be searching SAG today. Use your search mirrors. Use your probe sticks. Oh, yes. This is the fun part of the job. It's 4 a.m. Officers hope to catch the dealers red-handed. Lieutenant Gribble is here. He'll be floating between both sides to address any written material that you can clearly identify what it is. And we'll try to get it identified to determine if it is gang-related. Before the officers storm the unit and wake the inmates, a drug dog makes a quiet sweep, determining which cells are most suspicious. Then, the shakedown begins. All right, let's proceed. Before entering each cell, officers strip search the inmate. They won't even open the door until they shackle him. After they remove him, two officers then search the cell. Taking every precaution, a third officer stands guard over the prisoner, watching his every move. They ain't gonna find nothing now. They're searching for two kinds of contraband. Nuisance contraband, too much of anything. Toiletries, magazines, letters. Anything that gives inmates more places to hide the other kind. Dangerous contraband. Money, gang-related materials, weapons, drugs. If officers discover either kind, the inmates' time in segregation could be extended. Officers must think outside the box. Inmates have perfected the art of hiding contraband in plain sight. Uh, it's actually the finger out of a rubber glove, and uh, you put whatever the substance is inside of it. Once they tie one end of this right here, they actually drop it in the toilet. They'll take tape, put underneath the lid, flush the toilet. But if you ain't paying close attention, it's something that you'll look over real quick, and they'll just reach in there and pull it out. Most stuff that I have found has been somewhere common, just like a trash can. This stuff right here is crazy, man. I ain't never seen nothing like this, man. Though they know where to look, officers aren't finding much. Someone may have tipped off the inmates. I heard y'all coming, but... Normally, the inmates know that, that we're coming to do a search a lot of times before a lot of the staff does. So it's nothing new to them. They know we're coming, so they go ahead and prepare for it 90% of the time. It has always been a, a cat and mouse game in prison facilities between staff and inmates. Uh, the inmates will find ways and places to hide contraband, will catch on to it, and they'll find another place. It's very much a game to a lot of the, the population just trying to get over on us. But sometimes it's more than a game. Somebody's dropping a dime on you, man. You can, somebody out there's got a beef with you. I got a letter on my desk. 
and said that you was going to stick me. Gribble frequently gets threats like these. Whether or not they're legit, he needs to take them seriously. He knows well enough that inmates have the means to follow through. This come out of a, a tray in a microwave. The plate sits on this and it rotates around. They were breaking the fingers off and sharpening them down. And this is just a handle off of a uh, Bic razor. It's crude, but it will kill you. They can run this in your spine, the back of your neck, snap it off. We could never get it out. And by the time they got an officer to surgery or an inmate, probably be dead. The officers come away from the shakedown mostly empty-handed. There are no drugs. There are no weapons. But there is one small item. In a gang member's cell, officers find a prisoner's name and number written on the back of a receipt from a local store. Seemingly innocuous, except for one thing. The only way an inmate in SEG could possess a receipt is if a staff member had given it to him. Why would a staff member pass an inmate's name to a gangster? Could it be drug-related? Back in Blue Unit, new officer Larry Carver moves from the safety of the control room and faces violent criminals on the day room floor. Like I said, before anything can happen, you never know. So it's, it's two different worlds from up there and down here. Yeah, I know, but this isn't the time for interviews. Almost immediately, an angry prisoner confronts him, frustrated with Alexander's extreme restrictions. Not a prison mate. There's a whole lot more than you see. Okay, that's enough. Do not people want to know um, a convict's view of uh, the criminal justice system, penology, etc., etc.? No, you know just as well as I do, there's other ways to handle this. Well, how's that? What, right agreement to it? Well, you have your grievance forms, you have your, you have your town hall meetings. Come on. Go ahead. That's not for us in there, okay? Carver's lucky. In a few weeks, that same inmate will assault an officer without warning. But Carver's luck won't hold out for long. Soon, he'll be fighting for his life. Lieutenant James Gribble's investigation into the drug ring has produced some disturbing leads. The mysterious receipt found during the shakedown in SEG implies a prison staff member is somehow involved with an inmate. To further the investigation, Gribble will have to question some of the most dangerous convicts in segregation. Harold Goins sees a lot of what goes on back in SEG. But getting him to talk will be a challenge. It's like they try to pick us for information. To me, I'm not a snitch. I'm a straightforward individual. You know, because certain things is not meant to be spoken. For Goins, actions speak louder than words. At a previous facility, he attacked an inmate who uttered a racial slur. I kicked him in his face. His head hit the bars, and then from there, you know, I just beat him too. He didn't get back up. Goins paralyzed the inmate. For him, violence comes naturally. I'm sort of a cold nature person. You know, when I commit a crime, I don't have an instinct for it. You know, emotions is something I don't really deal in that much. You know, because I never grew to love people. You know, so. It's nothing for me to do what I do, I just do it. Now this cold and calloused inmate faces the lieutenant in the hot seat. I got a bad drug problem, dude. And you're aware of it. See this cat right here? Gribble cuts to the chase. If I come to you and want to buy some rotten or some Oxycontin or some Xanax, what's it gonna cost me? I'm not sure, because I don't pop pills. I mean... All right. The only reefer. That's the only thing still, I deal with. How much a cap? Ten dollars. Ten dollars. Yeah. I can get fifteen for a hundred still. Yeah. If Goins knows anything about the pills, he's not saying. But he talks candidly about marijuana. So Gripple presses further. When I left the yard, anyway. Let me ask you this: 
If I was a dirty staff member and you want me to bring in ounce, two ounces, three ounces a week, how much I'm going to get for that? How much you going to give me to mule it in here? I'll pay you 250 items. 250 an ounce? 250 ounce. Uh, All right, bud. To probe the staff angle, Gribble brings in the gang member who was caught with the receipt. Javon Monk is doing 41 years for kidnapping and armed robbery. My concern is this come from the outside. And you know what my boss asked me when they showed him this this morning? I need to know if you got it from a staff member or not. That's what I need to know. But a staff member have had to given it to somebody in order to put that on there. So where did you get this from? Janitor, pass it to you? No comment. No comment. You know what I'm up against here? If I got staff members dealing, I need to know about it. And if you don't want to tell me, I can't make you tell me, but I got to ask. All right. Most inmates are reluctant to talk, so Gribble brings in the one he's come to depend on. If Avery Cummings can't point him in the right direction, the investigation could sputter to a halt. Now, I got a question for you. Hypothetical situation. I'm you. And I want to score Oxycontin, Xanax, Rottens. I don't do the pills, so I don't. But who would I contact to do? I mean, how would I go about doing that? I don't do the pills, so I really don't know. All right, let's say I want some reefer. I just talk to my brother. Somebody know. That's all I do. It's not going as well as Gribble hoped. Avery has an occasional connection for marijuana. And as for the other drugs, he claims to be completely ignorant. You got any idea how much it's selling for? I mean, I know it's here. I heard it's here, but I ain't been around it, so I can't say I don't know what nobody charged for that and all that other stuff. Only thing I concern myself with is my specific drug of choice. If it ain't that, then I don't pay it no attention. For Lieutenant Gribble, it's a crushing disappointment. Just when he needs Avery's insight most, Avery can't help. What's more, the days of looking to Avery for help may be coming to a close. Gribble has news about the gang rehab program. The way it looks right now, I'm waiting to get word from Raleigh if they're gonna, when they're going to take you in that program. Could be tomorrow, could be For tomorrow. Avery, the news is devastating. They don't understand some of us have died for going through this program, just for completing it. Because in order to complete this program, you've got to sign some paper. Avery's gang has made it very clear. If he signs away his gang affiliation, they will kill him. This is what came to me word for word. If I sign any paper at that program, my life is forfeited. So now why would they subject me to something that would possibly take my life? So now I'm stuck with two choices. Either get in trouble and stay away from that program and stay in a hole for nine years until I get out, or go to this program and possibly die when I get out. Back in blue, it's just another Saturday afternoon for Officer Larry Carver. Suddenly, he gets an emergency call. Two inmates are fighting on the upper level. The first officer on the scene breaks up the fight. But when Carver reaches the top of the steps, the inmates turn toward him. As the first one approaches, Carver reaches for his pepper spray. And he said, if you spray me, I'll beat you. And he took two steps forward, and I sprayed him. And then he just came back swinging and backed up. And I fought with him for a little bit and got one hit in the back to the back of the head and went down. And that's all I can remember after that. I remember going down and not really much else. Unit manager Eric Dye is still piecing together exactly what happened. We don't know the full details behind the assault, but uh, we just know it was, it was pretty bad. And it was, it was really uncommon because we're used to inmates on inmates, but we're not used to inmates uh, sending our staff out to the hospital. The fight between inmates may have been faked, 
a setup to lure officers to the scene. It was over in less than a minute, but in that time, inmates severely beat Carver and three other officers. In my position, even though it only took 15 seconds for backup to get here from all different units, it felt like an eternity to me. It felt like I was 20 minutes up there before anybody showed up. But, I mean, you watch the, the tapes of it, 15 seconds. The North Carolina Department of Corrections won't release the security cam footage, but the incident shows just how little time inmates need to turn the tables. There's no way to control everything. During this incident, you had day room open, so you had 48 inmates in the wing just sitting around everywhere. There's no way to control something if it was going to go off, and then it went off. A squad of 15 officers responded to the emergency and took the unit back by force. But some problems in prison require a different strategy. If Gribble intends to get the drug smuggling under control, he'll need inmates working with him, not against him. Now there's only one inmate who can truly help him, but to do so, he would have to rat out other inmates. And in prison, that could be fatal. For Gribble, the challenge will be getting him to talk without getting him killed. Lieutenant Gribble calls upon the final lead in his investigation, an inmate who definitely knows about the drug ring and the possibility of staff involvement. The inmate who wrote the note Gribble pulled from the trash. Finding him was easy. He put his cell number on the note. Now the question is, will he talk when talking could get him killed? I'm just going to ask some questions about all this stuff, and I need just get some answers from you. All right. For his own safety, the inmate's identity is obscured. What do you know about s Despite the potential consequences, he doesn't hold back. Deals, peels, hides uh, marijuana in bags of chips. You buy it from the canteen, they'll just give you a bag of chips. That way it looks like you're getting chips, but you're really getting the drugs. He'll if Gribble's surprised, he doesn't show it. He wants to keep the informant talking. What kind of pills are you dealing? Uh, I didn't think it's hand on. Most of the deals are like Oxycontin, Xanax. The inmate is spilling it all, giving up everything and everyone he knows. With each answer, the full scope of the drug ring begins to take shape. What about him? His wife brings him stuff to visitation. You know that guy right there? He gets them himself from medical. How's he getting them in? His mother brings him. His mother? Yeah. He seems to be giving solid information, including the methods visitors use to smuggle in drugs. If they bring it into visitation, how are they getting it in here? Well, some of them just put it in their bra. Mm -hmm. Some women will do like a, put a little string, hold like a quarter wrapper. You get a quarter wrapper, you put the dope in a quarter wrapper. They put a string on it, like a tampon string, mm -hmm. and stick it, you know. Right. And then they go to the bathroom, the bathroom, take it out, come to the table and give it to him, and he'll suitcase it. Suitcasing refers to hiding contraband in the anal cavity. But he never tells anybody what he's getting or when she's coming. That the way. inmate continues to reveal vital information. Suddenly, without any prompting, he gives Gribble his biggest lead yet. That's you, that's you, that's you. I hear rumors there's a school teacher doing something, but I've, you know, I've been back here for a while, so I wouldn't really... Which school teacher? Nah, I don't know. I just heard some guys talking about a school teacher, so... Carrying stuff in here or what? Yeah. I heard the guy started out small asking for cologne and stuff, just more or less getting them comfortable. On second shift? I guess, I don't know. It's on a school. I'll find out. I don't know what I know. Over the course of a half an hour, the inmate has named names, revealed smuggling methods, and offered Gribble what could be the most shocking information of all. The drug ring may involve his own staff. I'll, I'll take care of it. I probably got five or six staff members tied into this somehow, or rumored to be tied into it. That we haven't proven yet. Money, transfers, uh, mule and drugs in here, making contacts on the street. Uh, so it's going to be 
a big investigation to get all this busted up. All these guys down here. Armed with new intelligence, Lieutenant Gribble assembles the trusted members of his staff. Well, he'll do whatever he can. It's time for a sobering discussion. We got a serious, serious drug problem going on. Oxycontin, Xanax, Ritalin, marijuana is coming in here constantly. And with that amount of drugs in here and with the amount of money that's being generated because of it, somebody's going to end up getting seriously injured or killed over this drug problem. We've identified some of the, the suppliers and the users that we know are doing it on a regular basis. From what I understand, the biggest percentage of Oxycontin and Xanax are coming in during visitation. One guy's mother brings it in here on a regular basis. Once he's laid it out, the lieutenant hits the group with the hardest news of all. One of the worst possible situations in any prison. I know staff is dealing with inmates. This receipt with another inmate's name and opus number on the back was from a staff member. He couldn't have got any other way. The receipt is now just one of the leads that points to staff involvement. Fortunately, it's one that's easy to follow. I'm going to contact the manager at Walmart, and I'm going to pull her video. It's got the register number, time of day, operate, and I'm going to find out who passed this receipt. I'm going to find them and put the word out. If the staff member's carrying in here, I am going to get them. To collect concrete evidence, Gribble will use surveillance equipment to catch the suspects in the act and get the drug problem under control. In the morning, guards arrive at Avery Cummings' cell in segregation. They tell him it's time to go. With no warning, Avery is being transferred to another facility. He has no idea what awaits him. New procedure. Gribble breaks the news and Avery's worst fears are realized. He's finally being sent to the STG gang rehab program. You'll be going to the STG unit from Marion. I just don't know when. Will I be going back in the long term, sir? I don't know. That I don't know. Because your file's already at footage. So I called there yesterday, and they still have it. So obviously, they're anticipating on you coming. So just get with Officer Rich, and he can give you more information than I can. Avery knows the only way to avoid the program is to do something that will keep him in seg. But the program isn't going away, and he's got nine more years to serve. You and I go back a long ways, and I don't see you get jammed up over some stupid stuff. So keep your head about you. You're going to be riding here in a minute. It's a hopeless situation. But Avery is philosophical. Depends on how, how, you, how you live with the situation. Could be good, could be bad. As one inmate leaves, another wave arrives, and the cycle continues. Arriving convicts will look for new ways to get around the system, and officers will try to maintain the upper hand and keep the inmates in check. For Officer Larry Carver, that means returning to face the inmates who put him in the hospital. No longer green, Carver has passed through the fire of initiation. You still got to stay on your toes because you don't know what they're up to. None of us are mind readers. We don't know what's going on with them. And all we know is just the information that we get. So just always be prepared. You can sit here and have the most maximum security prison on earth, and it still happen. At Alexander, the potential for violence is always there. Here's one of my possible games. Each week, more inmates shuffle in. They could be murderers. They could be rapists. They could be drug dealers. For Lieutenant James Gribble, 
every new inmate could be a source of information or trouble. But for now, he sets his sights on finishing the job at hand. The drug investigation will be concluded. I will.